Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining. We are so heartened that so many of you are interested in taking part in this very important conversation today. Um, you know, before we get started, a few things to know. Uh, we are recording the event today and we'll be posting a video and sharing a link in the coming days. Um, if you'd like to submit questions or comments to the panelists during the event, uh, you can do so on Zoom through the chat function and on YouTube Live as well. Um, you may need to be logged in if you're joining us today on YouTube. Uh, if you, if you want to share on social media, either during or after the event, you can tag the museum at MN Child Museum on Instagram and Twitter and Minnesota Children's Museum on Facebook. Um, I'm your moderator today. I'm Bob Ingracia. I'm Vice President External Relations at Minnesota Children's Museum. And I'd like to just say a few quick words about why we're hosting this event today. We think it's incredibly relevant. Minnesota has had a tough year. In the middle of this global pandemic, we've had to uh, cope with the killing of the police killing of George Floyd, the street protests that followed, the trial of Derek Chauvin, the police killing of Dante Wright. You know, the list goes on. This has been a lot for us all to process. Uh, and we wanna, we wanna uh, help parents and be supportive of parents and in having meaningful and important conversations with children about, uh, about what's happened, you know, what's going on in our world and what needs to change in the future. Um, the museum wants to help drive positive change. We acknowledge that systemic racism and racial injustice are, are big problems in Minnesota and beyond. And we know that racial injustice harms children, harms the entire community. Children's brains are literally changed by the impact of racial injustice. And we think it's very important to talk openly and candidly with children about, about race, about injustice, and about building a better, more just and equitable future. Um, so I'd like to get started. Um, I'll intro briefly introduce the panelists. Um, if you'd like to learn more about each panelist, um, we've got more detail uh, on our event page at mcm.org. I'd like to start with Dr. Marietta Collins. She's Associate Professor and Director of Behavioral Medicine at Morehouse School of uh, Medicine in Atlanta. She's a clinical psychologist who has spent decades working with underserved youth and families. She's an author. She co-authored Something Happened in Our Town, which is a book for children about uh, how two families, one black and one white, uh, cope and process a police shooting in their town. Barb Faber is CEO of Indigenous Visioning this is an agency that ensures that tribal voices are heard at the state and federal level. Barb is a friend of the museum. She uh, has spent 30 years as a driving force and a leader uh, in the White Earth Nation, working to improve child care and uh, early childhood education. Diane Halsey is Senior Vice President at Think Small. This is a nonprofit organization that uh, is committed to uh, providing resources and advocacy to improve early childhood education throughout Minnesota. And finally, Dr. Katie Lingris is uh, assistant professor in the psychiatry department at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Uh, she's also a clinical psychologist. Uh, she specializes in early childhood mental health and social uh, emotional development in children. And she focuses on children who uh, experience uh, behavioral concerns and who have uh, suffered uh, traumatic experiences. So I'd like to dive in. Uh, the way this will work is I'll direct uh, a question or a general topic toward one of the panelists. The others can feel free to jump in or add to or ask their own questions. We'd like it to be a kind of a free flowing conversation as much as possible. So uh, let's get started. Diane, I'm gonna start um, a question for you. Why is it important for parents and other caregivers to uh, talk about race and racial injustice? Why is this important? I'm going to ask to unmute her. It's classic Zoom. Hold on, Diane. You're muted. Of course. You, <laughs> you hear me now. Okay. We got you. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to be on this um, uh, illustrious panel and to talk about this very important topic. I just want to give um, kudos to uh, the Children's Museum for even holding this. 
um, event. So thank you for that. So to answer your question, why is it important for parents to talk to their children about race and, and racism? Um, so I have a personal uh, dream that I'll share with you. And that is that one day our children will be able to have the kinds of conversations that we cannot seem to have here in Minnesota about race. And so it's important for us to have conversations with children about race and racism so that they know that they can have these conversations. Um, I think that there's a misnomer that um, children can uh, conform racist ideas by talking about race, but actually they're already forming these ideas. In fact, as early as six months old, a child um, begins to recognize a race that is different than their caregivers. And actually by about three years old, we start developing implicit biases. And by about five or six, those biases are already set in. And for children of color, um, they are already uh, showing effects of racialized trauma as early as seven years old or maybe earlier. And one of the reasons why um, it's important is because, um, because parents are often uncomfortable talking about race to each other. So they are uncomfortable talking to their children about it. Um, and so it's important for parents to get their children comfortable talking about these, because if they don't talk about it, all the children are left with is to learn from the implicit biases of their caregivers and their environment without the context. Um, it's important to validate children's experiences that they may be having about race. And I think also because parents are uncomfortable about, about it, they oftentimes think that they have to have all the right answers and they have to know everything perfectly. And that is not true either. The important thing is um, just to be able to open the conversation so that children know that they can talk about race. It is not a taboo subject um, and, that, um, and that they can ask questions. They can come back later and ask questions of their caregivers. Great. And, and I'm just gonna make this point explicit and Barb, just to follow up uh, and Diane, thank you for that. Cause I, I think you, you made a, a good point and I wanna just follow up with Barb just to make it explicit. Cause I've heard some parents say it's racist to talk about race. And Barb, what, what would you say if you heard a neighbor or a colleague or a friend say, oh, we don't talk about race cause that's racist. Um, well, being an early childhood advocate all my life, um, I would say that um, we need to talk about race and celebrate diversity. Instead of just say, talking about being a racist, we got to celebrate diversity. I think that's on a level that children can comprehend. Um, and racism, just like other diseases, it's 100% percent preventable. But we need to start early. And we need, um, while we can't erase the historical trauma and the effects of historical trauma on generations, um, we can start by um, helping children embrace diversity and embrace differences and being intentional, like having those conversations with children. And like Diane just said, they, from a young age, they can tell that difference. And research tells us that the chronic stress um, leads to actual changes in hormones um, that cause inflammation in a body, marker for you know, chronic disease. And I'm sure the experts on the panel will um, talk more about that. But um, we do need to have those conversations with children. And we need to um, expose our children to as much diversity um, that we can by, you know, having um, conversations, watching movies, um, reading books to children that um, um, celebrates diversity. And, you know, to, for children to see people of color as heroes uh, and not just victim, victims of oppression. 
you know, right. um, we, we need to encourage parents and care, caregivers to be intentional in those conversations. Great. Um, thank you for that, Barb. Right. Um, I'm going to ask a question uh, to Marietta. Um, so I think sometimes an, uh, a number of parents or caregivers are, are tempted to respond to a child that, that initiates a conversation about race or makes an observation about race. Um, that you know, all people are the same, or we don't see color. Um, and wondering, like, is that something that you encounter, and and is that an effective approach or not an effective approach? Well, thank you so much for having me here, and I, I um, certainly do applaud the comments that both Diane and Barb have made um, thus far, and it leads you know right into um, some of the issues that we talk about, um, and something happened in our town. Um, it's certainly, you know, some parents will find it uncomfortable to talk about race with their children. And um, some parents may think that, well, as long as I'm not overtly discriminating or saying negative things, you know, about people who are of a different race than I am, then I'm giving my child a message that's a good message. And that is that, you know, everybody's the same. All people are the same. I'm treating everybody equally. But you know, what that really does is, is that really dismisses the, you know, the rich diversity um, within, with, within all peoples, within all peoples. So we really um, consider the, um, everybody's all the same. I sh sh don't, don't say anything. If a child says, oh, you know, I'm in the grocery, we're in the grocery store, a child sees a man who, who, is, who is black, African-American child, you know, may innocently say, mom, why is that man so dirty? Why didn't he take a bath? And you as a, a mom might be mortified and say, shh, shh, you know, don't say that that's not nice. Um, you know, certain, which is certainly a colorblind approach to parenting when we espouse instead is what we call race conscious parenting, where in fact diversity is cel celebrated, it's openly discussed, okay? And the door remains open for continued discussion about differences. You know, in that same scenario, when a child might say, mom, you know, you know, why is that man dirty? You know, certainly you would, you know, would correct him and say, no, you know, he's not dirty. Um, that is the color of the color of his skin is, is brown or, you know, depend upon what he looks like, you know, because he's of a different race. Um, people who, who are dark brown are dark brown because their ancestors came here from a country in Africa where everybody looks like them, okay, in terms of the skin color. So just being open to differences, calling differences, you know, out just talking about them openly with your children in an ongoing manner is a lot more effective than um, not discussing race at all and having your children think that it is taboo. Because even if, in fact, you don't talk about race, as you know, I think Barb and Diane said, children become aware of race very early on. And, you know, we, you know, as parents, um, our caregivers, you know, we are the models that children look to in terms of race and racial relationships. So even if we were to um, espouse, let's say a color, um, what is it, a color brown versus a race conscious parenting approach, if they look at us and see that we're surrounding ourselves with people who look just like us, that if, if they don't see us having cross-racial friendships, they don't see our homes um, reflecting diversity, either in the artwork, in the dolls, your little kids might play with um, in the, I guess I'll say, even in the extracurricular sports activities you'd be involved your children in, then they're getting a message that, eh, you know, that's not quite right. You know, I should stick with, with my race. My, you know, I feel more comfortable here. So it's important, I think, very early on to have conversations, open conversations with, with children about race and to really um, espouse um, a race conscious parenting approach. Great. Thank you for that. Um... We had a question come in um, through the chat um, that I want to uh, direct toward Katie, um, having to do with age. Uh, when, is, w when is it appropriate? What age? Um, and we'll, we'll explore this a little further because I think this is important. And a lot of parents are wondering about types of conversations by age, you know, a, a toddler, a three, four year old, and then when children get older. Um, so, what what age is appropriate um, to start these kind of conversations? Yeah, thanks for that question, Bob, and thanks uh, as well for convening this panel. Um, I agree, it's a, a very important topic, and I'm so glad we're all getting to chat together today. 
Um, you know, I think one thing you've heard from all of us so far is that kids are noticing race and noticing even racism from really early ages. And so kids are noticing difference even as early as infancy. And so there really is no point which kids are too young, right? When they're never too young to start talking about race, just like they're never too young to start describing the world around them and the cars that are passing by and the grass that's turning green outside. Um, kids are noticing things in the world. And, and as we've heard, you know, kids are noticing differences in skin color, differences in hair, differences in the way that people look. And so one of the ways that we can help normalize and celebrate difference is to talk about that even with infants, right? And um, so, you know, as you've heard, uh, as Mariana shared the, um, that example in the grocery store, you've likely heard kids and been with kids who pointed out difference. And they are, there are no shortage of questions that kids have to ask. And so when they're starting to ask these questions and notice these things, it's our job as adults to let them know these are okay things to talk about, right? And again, we can start doing that from as early as infancy. And the biggest thing that we want to really be thinking about too is being proactive, right? We've heard from, from a few of my colleagues here that this idea of kids are picking up uh, stereotypes and biases really early on. And so if we wait to talk about it, even until preschool or later than that, then kids are getting information from the world around them. They're getting information about the biases, about our society and the systemic racism that exists in it. And so they may actually be getting ideas that we don't necessarily agree with. We wouldn't teach them, but they're taking those ideas in already. And so if we're being proactive, we're really starting from those infancy, early ages of talking about these things. By the time they start to notice and pick up on these biases, even just a year or two later, they've already got some messages coming from them. And, and we can use things like toys and books and things in our environment to start these conversations. You know, one of the things that I, I think about in terms of how we, we start these conversations and what we talk about, and you were starting to allude to how do we do this at, at different ages, is and I, this idea of um, taking bites of an apple, and this is an analogy that comes from Beverly Daniel Tatum, who wrote Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria. Um, if you ever, ever have been around a young child who has asked for an apple, chances are you've seen them take a bite, put it back down on the counter, walk away, go play for a little bit, come back, take another bite, then walk away and play for a little bit. And maybe over the course of an afternoon, they've eaten part of an apple, maybe the whole apple, but they're coming back when they're ready. They're coming back to take that next bite. And so when we think about starting these conversations, if we've opened the door, we can give those bites of the apples and they're gonna come back. We're gonna let them know it's okay to keep talking about this and they'll have an experience and come back and ask us about it and know that it's okay to talk about. And we can kind of adjust our language based on that, those ages and those experiences. Great, and uh, just kind of a follow-up really to the group. I mean, curious like wh what it sounds like. Let's talk a little bit about maybe a three or four-year-old who's really noticing can um, I follow up to that? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Bob. Yes. Yep. So Go I ahead. so I just want to um, really um, follow up on what both Katie and, and Dr. Collins said. So true. Um, you know, young children are, um, are, are like sponges. So they're really picking up everything around them. And, and they, um, they categorize things to kind of help them make sense of their world. And so they're not born racist, but they are born very curious. And so when they point out things like a different color, they're trying to categorize, we're the ones that attach some kind of racist um, meaning behind it, but they're just trying to categorize, like in the example that Dr. Collins gave in the grocery store, that young child is just trying to categorize what they're seeing because they've never seen it before. So um, being able to talk to your young children about the fact that there are different races, there are different colors, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's all good, it's just different, um, is important. Um, being able to say, you know, it's just like they might, you know, point out the fact that, you know, the grass is green and the flowers are red. Yes, that's true. And so you'll say, yes, that person has brown skin or yes, that person's uh, hair is a little darker, a little coarser and, and, but do it in a way that you're, 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 you're celebrating the fact that it's, it's great and it's different. It may be different, but it's great. You know, just like, um, just like you are great. And it's important to, um, 
to do that in a way and to say it in a way that is not um, scary or, you know, ominous, um, because they pick up on all of that, too. They pick up on on, on those things. And so um, the other thing I wanted to say about that, too, it's not always just even what you say, it's how you behave. So if you go into, for instance, if a white person goes into a room full of black people and they um, unconsciously are very tense, their body tenses up, then that child that you're with will learn to tense their body up when they walk into a room full of, of African-Americans. And the opposite is true too. If you don't tense up, if you're very relaxed, the same as you always are everywhere else, then that child will learn to be relaxed the same as they are everywhere else. And so those are some other things for you to be aware of in your body when you when you are around, um, especially for white people, if there are around um, children of color or, or people of color, um, to notice those things and be cognizant of that also when you're with your children. Great, thank you for adding that. Um, we're getting a number of questions through chat um, to kind of push a little further because we first part of our conversation really here is about young children noticing and this talking about race as differences and noticing and acknowledging and celebrating differences. With older kids then, um, we're getting questions about like, okay, what about these very difficult incidents? What about race, uh, racial injustice? What about police shooting a black person and now we're talking about that it's on the news and the you know kids are talking about it in the street so marietta i mean that you wrote it you co-authored a book about this and i know it, it'll be a different answer for a uh, black family back uh, black parents and white parents and other parents of color so uh, how, how what does it sound like to talk to a maybe seven or eight year old about these very uh, difficult topics Thank you for that question. And I've been noticing, you know, the, the uh, questions in the uh, Q&A and chat, and these are all just excellent questions. And I really appreciate how engaged the audience is. Um, and the way our, our book starts, you know, is that um, something bad happened in our town. Um, the parents didn't think the kids knew, but the kids knew. And that's pretty much the way it is that parents may think, oh, you know, he doesn't know about the police shooting. He doesn't know about this or that, but kids hear about things. You know, they hear it in my book, you know, from their older siblings and from the adults just talking about it. And what happens is that, you know, there's a, there's a, a little white girl, there's a little black boy. They each go to their respective homes and they ask questions, you know, can like they ask questions about the police. I saw a couple of questions in the chat about the police. You know, why did the police shoot that man? Was that man bad? Was it a, you know, those kinds of things. So being open um, to talking about the history of racism in our country is really important. And our book provides a guide for how to do that in um, age appropriate language. With, within the um, little white girl's family, that family talks about the fact that they own slaves and that slaves were people that had to do everything that somebody said. They didn't have a choice and that that was wrong to do. In the Black family, the Black family talks about the fact that, yes, they were part of, of people who were enslaved against their will. And that, but, but despite that, uh, we have many leaders who have been able to overcome that. We advocated, we, we, uh, we marched, we protested so that we could have civil rights. You know, so again, what this book does is to really provide some um, very child-friendly language for parents and, and in terms of how to talk to children about this difficult subject. Um, we have a, a note in the back of the book that has um, role plays uh, with definitions for racism, discrimination, prejudice. You know, how can you integrate this into a, a classroom setting if that's what you want to do? But, you know, you know, I can't remember which of these, um, these well-spoken um, women said it, but you don't feel that you have to have all the right answers at that moment. Because again, just as uh, Katie said, the child's gonna come back again and want another bite of that apple. You know, so you can say, oh, you know, I thought about it and the answer I gave, eh, it might not have been so clear. Let, let, let me say something else about it. What you're doing is you're modeling that you're open to talking about it. And that once, just because you've had the conversation one time doesn't mean that the door is closed. Oh no, the door remains open. Right. Barb, I wanna just build on that. Um, and language around 
you know, uh, Marietta talked about language around slavery, right? Very difficult, painful, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, with that. Uh, what about with uh, Native nations and what might that conversation sound like um, regarding the, you know, the difficult history in America around um, Native Americans? Well, I, I would say that um, I would agree with what Marietta said is we, we need to talk about that we need to have those conversations with children and if we want them to um, to understand what racism is they also need to understand age appropriate of course um, what that historical trauma is in in order to understand those feelings that you don't even know you have you know even as adults um, we need to understand it before where we've been to know where we're going, um, and so those conversations are going to are going to help that. But at the same time, you also need you also want to um, open open the conversation and ask the child what they're thinking. Um, what do they think about what could help um, us as a society um, to celebrate more diversity? Our what can the what does what is the child thinking when they're when they're asking us these questions and what are they thinking about the future? I think it's important to um, have those conversations, but also ask them about the future um, to to prompt those questions. Um, great, um, thank you for that. Uh, we're getting some really great questions in. Um, from, from the audience um, and wanting to follow up on some of them. I'm looking at some of the lists here. Um, one question we had, again, in this, in, beyond the noticing and the recognition of race, a question uh, that came in, um, do, you, do should parents be thinking about preparing kids ahead of time for the potential of mean comments? Um, for example, you know, against Asian Americans uh, or against um, black children, any child of color, really any, um, you know, any bias type things that they're going to they maybe encounter at school or elsewhere. Do you prepare kids in advance for this or just kind of maybe navigate that only when it occurs? Um, and I'll, I'll have, um, maybe have Katie jump in on that one. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think sort of one of the things that are that is kind of inherent to this question is, do we have to talk about this stuff, right, especially things like preparing kids for bias or police violence or civil unrest. And, um, you know, I think it's really important to be thinking about who, who it is that has to prepare their children for these kinds of experiences and the idea that if you are choosing not to talk about it that inherently is a privilege right because not all families are afforded the opportunity to be able to say oh this isn't really directly affecting us or this is happening 15 miles away we don't really have to talk with our kids about that um, and so you know i encourage you all to think too if, you, if that is something that you you've thought or you've been in that situation you know what does it mean for you if let's say your second grader isn't directly affected, quote unquote, but their classmates are hearing conversations and having conversations within their families about this idea of preparation for bias, what's gonna be coming up um, for them. What does it mean that those classmates know what's going on, have this experience and your child doesn't? Um, you know, I think a lot of, well, one of the things we've been alluding to is a lot, of, a lot of adults now are having to undo learning or lack of learning that we either did or didn't experience in, in our childhoods. And so, Kind of imagining what it might be like for kids to grow up having these conversations could result in really different experiences throughout childhood but also as adults when they go to parents um so i think you know in terms of, of kind of preparing for these conversations you know i'm gonna i'll let diane speak a little bit more to kind of the the differences in what these conversations might look like but i think that um one of the things that we really want to think about is is doing our own work first right so processing our own emotions whether you are a parent or a caregiver of color or a white caregiver, a, a, a white caregiver, what is your experience? What are your emotions? What are your biases? Kind of doing our own work first so that we can approach these conversations calmly with kids and we can send those messages that it's okay to talk about this isn't something scary. Um, really trying to start with what kids know and then 
giving those bites of the apple, giving really clear, concrete language, keeping things simple. Um, even things like talking about police violence can be made developmentally appropriate and concrete, right? Uh, Marietta's book is a great example of that. We can use kids' books. We can use really just simple language. You know, police kill the black man and people are really angry about it. They went out into the streets to say that they're angry. That covers a whole bunch of topics that have a lot of adult layers, but for kids as a starting point, we can just have those simple sentences. And we want to make sure that we're being real. So talking about what is going on, but also making sure that we're not sharing information in a, a really scary way or a potentially traumatizing way. So we want for young kids certainly to not be seeing, or for, for many age kids and many adults, not to be seeing traumatizing images, not to necessarily be watching the videos that are shared, uh, but talking about you know what's going on and explaining to them in, again, most developmentally appropriate uh, kind of details. I'd also like to kind of address, I'm sorry, Diane, no, you'd ahead. like to go ahead. Okay, mm -hmm. i also like to address what you had asked, Bob, in terms of uh, how do you uh, prepare kids um, to go out into the world? And that reminds me of another aspect of race conscious parenting, which is to prepare um, children for bias, which is out in the world, while also um, intentionally um, developing um, high self-esteem. So that's certainly really important to do um, within your home as you, because within your home, you can create an environment that is very supportive and loving and reinforcing for your child. You know, but if you are a person of color, um, when you leave that at home, they will face a world that's not always so nice, that's not going to always be so supportive. So um, having talks about the historical, um, the, uh, what happened in our history to create the kind of divisiveness that's out there, um, helping children to understand that, yes, this is a part of the history of America. These are the things that have happened to change this history, you know, but certainly talking about it early on, getting your child prepared, you know, that um, this is a part of your history. You know, this is what this is what we believe, you know, as a people, this is what we believe about ourselves, you are just as smart, you are just as attractive, you're just as, I mean, very direct language, you may not hear from the outside that those things are true, but we know that you, that they are true. So again, having these conversations very early on and repeatedly with your children before, you know, they are, are faced with going out into a racist world. I just want to really um, follow up on what Dr. Collins said. Uh, that is so key. And um, for for children of color, um, for those of us raising children of color, the self esteem part, what I like to call ego strength, is really yeah. important because um, that child is going to have to know who they are because the world will see them differently, yes. and there will be a point in time not not an if, but a when, when they are going to have to stand up and tell the world who they are, um, which is different from how they're being perceived. If they don't have that ego strength or that self-esteem, what happens is they internalize that racism and they begin to believe those negative messages that are told about them. Um, and I'm going to tell a quick story um, that that kind of that kind of illustrates this. So I, we have three boys and um, when our children were young, we did a lot, we, you know, we sent them to a, a preschool that was um, an African-American um, cultural preschool and, um, and which, you know, was great and they learned a lot, um, but then, you know, they went to public school and our public school is, um, is diverse, but many, most of the teaching staff are white. And so when my child moved, when my youngest son moved from sixth grade to seventh grade in our district, sixth grade was still in the elementary. So seventh was the uh, junior high was a big deal, you know? And, and so the first day I, I took off work a little early, I came home because I wanted to know how my son's first day of junior high went. And um, first thing he walked in the door and I was like, how did it go? First thing he said, um, my homeroom teacher is racist. And <laughs> I said, okay, uh, hold on a minute. Let's, <laughs> let's sit down and let's tell me what happened. So, um, so what happened is he walked into his homeroom class and um, the first thing, and my, my son was very bright. You know, I think he had some colorful clothes on, whatever. The teacher said, what's up, Flavor Flav? Now, 
for those of you who don't know who Flavor Flav is, he is an African-American man who is a known drug addict, and I can best describe him as a buffoon. And this is who he was referring my son to. And what my son did, which I was so proud of him, was that he said, uh, oh, no, my name is Winton. Now, see, what happened in those very few seconds is that that teacher was trying to tell him who he was, which was not a pleasant description, but he knew who he was, so he had to correct him. Those kinds of incidents happen all the time to children of color at all different ages. And our children need to know who they are because they're gonna have to sit, tell, unfortunately, they will have to tell somebody um, that their perception of them is not correct. But when that doesn't happen, when they're not able to do that, um, then the, uh, those, those um, images that people have, they just continue and they just perpetuate. So that's how important it is to really be able to have those conversations with children when they're young. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, that was very important to hear. Um, I wanted to build on that again, uh, talking about um, the external world, try, maybe telling people who, who they are when that's not truly who they are. And, and obviously a lot of that can come from the police, right, in our community. So, and how policing and law enforcement treats people differently because um, we are getting a lot of questions I want to I want to see what different panelists might say a, a number of questions about speaking to children about police uh, and a couple of questions saying you know a year ago I normally would have just said oh the police they're here to help us and they're heroes or that kind of thing around the police and now right there's different messages coming at children and maybe questions being asked are all police bad can somebody jump in and talk about what a conversation might sound like with a four or five, six-year-old about, you know, what parents might, uh, how we might address police specifically. We're getting a number of questions about that. Like, how do I talk about the cops? So, so one of the uh, parts in our book that has been somewhat controversial is the whole issue of, uh, of, the, of the police shooting. And um, one of the characters in the book um, says that, um, would police shoot me? You know, yeah, police would shoot me just because I'm black. And I think the father might say that. And um, just trying, so we've, we've received um, lots of, uh, I guess I say negative comments. Our book has been banned in some, in some um, states from being in specific school systems. What we try to do in our book is really to provide a more nuanced view of police officers. What the parents say is that um, not all policemen are bad. You know, that in fact, mom's, mom's girlfriend, Keisha, she's a police officer, not all, not, they're black police officers and white police officers, sometimes they make good, good choices, but then sometimes they make mistakes. And as Black people, we can't always count on them to, um, to treat us fairly. You know, so we have to be aware of the fact that people do look at us, you know, as Black people, okay? And um, again, given the historical information we've already talked about in the book, you know, we do talk about, you know, the, uh, I guess I'll say the positive and the negative sides, you know, that police officers have shown to, uh, to Black people. Within the uh, back section of the book, you know, there is certainly dialogue and lots of information that talks about the fact that, you know, most policemen never even shoot their guns. You know, they try to solve problems nonviolently. You know, there is a move to have more community policing so that children can get to know police officers, you know, on a, on a kind of a one-on-one -on -one more informal basis. One of the things that's really striking is when we first start to promote um, our book and um, my co-authors are white, um, um, lots of people are really struck with the fact that Black people have the talk, you, you know, with their kids, you know, very early on about police officers. We can re remember, um, you know, parents in the audience who were white saying, well, I didn't know that. I did not know that that that, that happened, that that had to happen. It was really an eye opener. So, um, so certainly it's really important to, you know, to kind of to talk, you know, openly about police officers, you know, and be able to have, again, have those ongoing conversations. Anybody else want to 
tackle that one. I think this is a great example too of thinking about, you know, what kind of nuance you add as kids get older. So, um, and, and as well, kind of knowing history and knowing the history of our country. So knowing that policing started out in the times of slavery and, you know, kind of the roots of policing can help, especially older kids who might have learned some of this history or may not have, um, to contextualize, you know, why might there be biases in how policing works? Why might, why might there be different experiences? And with young children, you may not get into all of those different layers in the same way, but, you know, many preschools and, and infant toddler classrooms do units on community helpers. And so that can be a time where you start to talk about, you know, what has your experience been like? There might be people who have different experiences with different types of community helpers. And, and again, starting to normalize, not that, that that exists, it shouldn't be normal, but that people have different experiences based on their identities. And that can be part of the conversation even from those early years. Yeah, I, I will add that, um, that children are already, um, if you don't have the conversation with them about police, they are already picking things up. And they're already forming their opinions about police. Um, there's um, a colleague of mine who runs a, um, um, a, a child care program at the University of Minnesota. And um, one of the child had a medical uh, situation. So an ambulance came and uh, with them, the ambulance, the police showed up. And one of the children looked at the police and asked her, is that one of the good police or one of the bad police? So they're already forming ideas about police already, just because that's a conversation that's in our environment right now. And I think it's, it, it is important to, to say um, what the situation is developmentally appropriate. It's okay to say that there are some bad people in the world and some of those bad people might just happen to be police officers. That is not the, the majority of them. But, um, but then to talk about this is what it might look like, you know, very simply, this is what, you know, it might look like because they're already forming these opinions. And, and I would like to add on to that is just to reaffirm that um, having children understand what stereotyping is. I mean, so the media has our, you know, has helped stereotype uh, police officers. So, you know, from the, so uh, I think the more children that can understand the term of stereotyping, I think that's gonna also help uh, with those conversations that just what Diane just said, not all police are bad and they are heroes, so. Yeah, Bob, you brought up media stuff and I wanted to ask about when we encounter as parents, um, stereotype and obvious bias or maybe not even uh, not even subtle bias in books cartoons shows lots of classic media that we encounter that kids will see um is there some, how might a parent respond when, when when we're watching like a movie and we see something that's maybe cringeworthy or you know, um, that kind of thing. What's a, what's a good way to, should we call it out um, and use that as an opportunity to talk about the concept of stereotyping? Um, I don't know, I, I'm wondering, Barb, what you might say uh, if you're, you know, to, to a young child when you see a, a totally like out there, inappropriate portrayal of, of uh, Native Americans, let's say in a cartoon, which i you know, that happened. I can think of a number of examples in pop culture about that. And so how, how might you address that with a, a child? Well, if I don't address it, that's a missed opportunity for me um, to talk about stereotyping and what that means. And, you know, that's a conversation, a perfect opportunity to talk about differences and, you know, the word stereotyping. Yeah, I would, turn I would it over to Kate or Dr. I would Collins. certainly agree. You know, I would, as you, you said, Bob, do you call it out? I would say, I would just talk about what just happened. Is that, uh, did you notice X, Y, and Z? What do you think about that? Okay. Um, how do you think that person felt when he heard someone say X, Y, and Z about that? Do you think what, 
um, what would you say in a situation like that? What could, how could you be a person that stands up for change and not just not just be a bystander and let those negative things happen. So certainly, you know, doing that kind of thing. And, and again, using age appropriate language, I think is important. I think, you know, the other thing, Bob, to go back to one of the examples you gave is this, this idea of the stereotypes when we run into them in media and, you know, movies and things like that. They're, they're not always egregious, right? They're not always obvious things that we have to call out that we can clearly see. And so I think part of that goes back to, you know, the more that we do our own work, the, the harder it is to unsee those kinds of things when they happen. And so, you know, you can be watching a movie prior to doing some of that work and not notice things and then starting to notice those those things and you know gives you those opportunities to start talking with kids about them and you know one of one of my personal examples about this is think about you know most disney movies that you've seen or most you know kids movies where there's a villain and odds are the villain has some sort of accent some sort of like foreign sounding accent or has you know um other sort of attributes that we would think about that are likely to be associated with folks of color. And so how many movies have we watched and not even thought about that? But as you start to think about that and see that, you notice kids are getting these messages implicitly without even having it be something very obvious. And so those implicit things are really important to call out and start conversations about as well. Yeah, um, thank you for adding that. Cause that's, you're right. Once you start, you're made aware then you're going to start noticing that kind of thing so much more often. Um, I'm going to see if I can surface another question. Oh, this is a tough one. I mean, we're talking about parents and caregivers, um, but we've got a number of teachers uh, who've joined our event today and hit, prompting some questions about um, how teachers might address this in a classroom, which raises different kinds of questions. It's, it could be multiracial. Um, you know, that's a possibly a bigger topic for another day, but I'm just wondering if there's any advice for um, teachers to spur a conversation in a broader group like that. Yeah, um, I'll, I, yeah. I'll say a couple of things about that. Um, one of them is there's, first of all, there's absolutely a lot that teachers can do in their classroom. Um, to create an environment that is open for conversation about race, um, that doesn't make it a, um, a, a heavy thing, especially when children are young. Like I said, it's, it's, it's good to celebrate um, children's differences and their cultures. There's a lot that you can do to do that and to really celebrate and have all kinds of books and, and toys and resources in the classroom that are multicultural. Um, and, and that's important if, the, if your classroom is multicultural, but I'll also want to say it's also important if all your children are white in the classroom. And we get that question a lot of times. People think if all of their children are white in the classroom, uh, maybe I don't have to be talk about this diversity thing. And that couldn't be further from the truth um, because this is, a, once again, especially when children are young, you have a preschool classroom, that is the age where we really want to be talking about these things and getting children comfortable talking about race and knowing how to celebrate race, uh, because that's the age that their biases are starting to set in. So if you're having these conversations and helping to frame them around, um, around um, their eyes and their mind to, um, to be able to celebrate um, this culture, and the fact of the matter is our world, our country is um, becoming increasingly more diverse. And so you're also preparing your children to be able to live in the multicultural society, you know, that we have now. Yeah, here's a question that came in too, um, about, it gets at what you're talking about, I think, with like an all white classroom. Uh, so the question is, can you give an example of how white parents can prepare or talk with their children about um, speaking out in support of uh, people of color and other children of color when they, perhaps when they're encountering uh, an injustice, they'll notice and they'll see an injustice. If, you, if you've been starting to have these conversations at home or whatever, and then now they start to see it out in the world, just like Katie was talking about, you, you made aware, you start to see it. Are, and then preparing children, 
I guess, to be an ally, uh, ultimately. And, and Marianne, I know it happens in the book, uh, in your book, uh, toward the, uh, that's the closing kind of anecdote there in the book. So I guess the question there is, the, the question from our, our audience was, should parents prepare and, and encourage, I guess, their children to, white children, white parents to st have their, their children stick up for or call out uh, an injustice and, and express that they're not gonna tolerate it on the playground or wherever. Yes, now, certainly in our, in our book, what happens is there's um, a child of, um, of, I guess I would say Eastern Indian descent who joins the classroom because it's a classroom that has black kids and white kids and a, and a new kid joins. And he's of Eastern Indian descent, doesn't speak English very well, you know, very shy. And um, when the kids go outside to play soccer, Everybody gets chosen for a team except that one little boy's name is Omar. And so the uh, black and the white kid remember what they learned from home about how you should, you should stand up and how it's not right to treat people who are different unfairly. And so they stick up for him and say, he is playing, he's gonna be on my team. So certainly, you know, you can give your child that message very early on that they have power, that they can, they can um, start to enforce change. I did also want to mention two books um, related to uh, parents that, that parents, especially white parents, might find to be very interesting. I, I shared this already earlier, so it should be on your resource list. But there are two books. One is called Raising White Children by Jennifer Harvey, which is very, it's excellent. And also How to Raise and how to raise an anti-racist child um, by uh, Rebecca Janop. So those are two great resources that we found to be very helpful in this journey that we've been on with our book. Yeah, and I uh, noticed in in the book and that anecdote when the girl steps up and says, you know, he's playing. Yes. And then she says, she says, we don't want to miss out. Right. She doesn't say we don't want him to miss out, mm -hmm. which I just thought was a very interesting way mm -hmm. to put that. And I want, wonder if you could talk about the point and whether that was purposeful and what you mean by the, the white girl saying, I don't want to miss out by having him not play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks for, for picking up on that. Well, the message we were trying to get, and, and we said it a little bit earlier in the book, is that you never know who's going to be your best friend, who might be your best friend. If you just discriminate against somebody, don't even give them a chance, you might be missing out. So she's like, hey, we don't want to miss out. This could be my best friend. I need an opportunity to get to know him. So yes, for right. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I know the the, the button. The uh, that grows into a bigger point around the entire society missing out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's where we're trying to get to, right? All of the potential and all the inventions and the artwork and the, right? All of that that will get made by people of color, if it's if they're thwarted or discriminated against, we lose. Everyone loses out. We lose out what they would have brought. Um, so I know we're we've still got a few minutes here. We've still got some great questions coming in. Um, uh, here's a, a, a white parent wrote a question to us. How do I expose my child to diversity in an authentic way? She says, we have lots of books, diverse books and toys, but she's talking about in person. She said, our neighborhood is all white kids and it seems wrong to just start signing them up for dance, soccer, et cetera, in different neighborhoods and to go to other neighborhoods um, just for that. She says, I don't want their, their new friends to feel like their token black friend or, or their family think we're hanging out with them just because they are black. Wow. Yep. So I, I don't know who wants to <laughs> tackle that one, but I mean, that's a thing that, you, you know, parents in, you know, um, not very diverse suburbs, let's say of Minneapolis or St. Paul, having that feeling, wanting to, right? Um, just wondering what you might say to them. One thing, one thing I will say, and then I, I'll open it up for the rest of the panelists is that um, children take a lot, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at you. So if you have a diverse network of friends and, and people that you, you know, um, socialize with, if you have black and brown friends that you have lunch with or come over to the house or, 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 you know, play cards with, um, that's going to show them. And so I, I, you know, I don't, no, if you're if you're just wanting them to have a diverse set of friends without you having a diverse set of friends and relationships, um, you know, I, I, does seem a little inauthentic. 
but um, but they're going to get more from you from watching you have your diverse network of of friends and relationships as as a model to them. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, you want to jump in on that one, Katie? Uh, yeah, I was just going to add, I think one thing inherent to that question is, you know, being able to show up authentically, right? So doing some of this work, thinking about these issues, having some of these conversations before you start to put yourself in a space that is different from, from your own family's, um, you know, culture, skin color, whatever it is, so that you're, you're genuine in wanting to learn more, but that you're not sort of showing up expecting to be taught or expecting to be um, you know, having others do a lot of emotional labor. And, you know, I think in that example too, the idea of, of resources is really important. So, you know, are you going to a community event that's open for everybody or are you going to another community and taking a slot in a soccer team that could be somebody, a, a slot that, that um, a child from that neighborhood could be using and sort of being intentional about what kinds of opportunities you, you take advantage of, particularly if you are someone who is white or more privileged that you're kind of being mindful of that. Well, we're getting down the last couple of minutes. I wanted to see, um, to hear from whoever wants to, to answer, um, just kind of final sort of words of encouragement or support for parents um, going forward, you know, starting now, like what, what, kind, of, what kind of words, what kind of um, support can you offer? Um, I'd like to respond to that. I think, um, you know, just it, it, throughout the conversations we had today, it is about being intentional and knowing that racism is 100% preventable. And so if children are starting out, um, you know, in the early years of learning about diversity, you know, that's, they're going to be in a better place and they're going to, um, you know, uh, lead by example. And I know, uh, you know, in the um, indigenous communities, uh, you know, we, we try to teach and utilize the teachings of the uh, Southern grandfathers of respect, of respecting elders and for everything we've learned, love to show love to those around us, truth to be truthful to ourselves and others, for bravery and courage, it's important to face our fears and be courageous for yourself or for others, wisdom to learn from the past and use that knowledge in our lives, very wise to think before you speak and plan before you act. Generosity, to have a giving heart shows much respect and love. Give someone support selfishly. And humility, to be humble to know your self-worth and recognize that we can always learn more and do better. It's accepting our part in life and creating how we show that acceptance and worth to others. So we need to nurture children's natural humanity and kindness to prevent um, racism now and in the future. Wow, great. Well, anybody else want to uh, try to follow up that awesome list? That's <laughs> really, I would agree. <laughs> um, what I would just say is that, um, you know, the, the main point of, uh, of what I what I've tried to say today, what's in our book is how important it is for, for parents to have these conversations with their children. In order for our society to change, um, we have to be committed to starting to have such conversations very early on in the lives of our children. We have to, again, we have to, to lead by example. You know, we have to show them that we are willing to to take that scab off the bandaid and look at it. That we're willing to um, to really talk about the um, the history of racism in our country, the history of civil rights in our country, how we've overcome. Um, you know. How, you know, why is it that, you know, some neighborhoods don't have the same kinds of resources as other neighborhoods? You know, we just have to really start again to openly have biblical conversations and not underestimate, you know, the sensitivity, you know, and observational skills of our kids. In order for there to be change, you know, we have to be committed to starting to make these changes at home ourselves and not wait until they go to school and say it's the um, responsibility of the school system, it's the responsibility of that person, or it's your responsibility as a parent of these children. And you want to be the parent that really um, instills the morals and values that are important to you and your family in your children's lives. Right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in because we're hitting right at one. Um, just for the participants, um, 
we're going to the we're going to follow up. We have a, a, a tip sheet um, that con consolidates some of what you heard today. A resource list. Um, uh, we'll have a link to the recording and a survey about this event. So that'll all be coming to the emails of people who, who uh, registered for the event. I want to thank everybody for participating. I also want to thank the University of Minnesota, which was uh, kind enough to give the uh, give the uh, Minnesota Children's Museum access to the Zoom platform so we could have so many people join. Um, so thanks everyone. Um, if Diana, Katie, if you have those final words, I wanted to get that in. If you have the final word, the kind of the last sort of uh, message of support um, for parents, go for it. Um, just quickly, I'll just say that um, these conversations, they don't have to be perfect. Um, and that, um, and, and sometimes you don't have, you may not have the answer. It's okay to say, I don't know, but it's just important to have the conversation so that children can know that they can talk about these things. And I'll just do a quick plug for my, my podcast, where we talk about these issues. We, we talk about how do we talk how do parents talk to young children about race? It's called Early Risers, and you can get it wherever you get your podcasts. Right. Thank you. Well, I think it's a great sign that my final word was going to be right along the same lines, just that there, there's no one shot. There's no one opportunity. You know, these, these conversations today, our group conversation is definitely not the, the end. It's hopefully the beginning or the continuation of learning and conversations and so definitely, you know, continue these conversations in your homes, in your in your classrooms with your children, whatever, whatever spheres you overlap with with children and with other adults as well. And know that you can keep coming back once that door is open and continue those conversations. Great. Well, thank you all so much. We I was just so grateful for your time and your expertise. Um, it's been very helpful. We're getting really great comments coming in saying thanking us, thanking. Uh, all of you for your time and um, all the great um, conversation and information that we talked about today. So I'm going to sign off. Um, thank you, everybody. And we'll be in touch via email with the resource list and the tip sheet and the survey link. So thank you very much. And this is uh, obviously not the end of the conversation, but we're so glad we were able to host this today. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.